Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. That's you. Thanks to all of you, including Steve Iadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, and Tony Glass. Coming up on DTNS, the UN asks countries not to blow up satellites in orbit. Seems reasonable. Amazon wants to eliminate barcodes. And do you know what the fastest growing brand was in 2022 worldwide? It was Meta. Lots to unpack there. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 9th, 2022. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. In Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And on the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane's off today. I almost wish Roger or I would have gone to New York just so we would have all four major time zones. Ooh. <laughs> I, but then I would we, like being in New York. Because usually Amos is here. Amos is still off, so we don't have Alaska. We, uh, maybe one of us should go to Hawaii. I don't know. We'll figure that oh, out. Oh, I'll go. Okay. But then we <laughs> wouldn't have the mountain time zone. I, uh, Keith can fill in. <laughs> time for the quick hits. <laughs> Elden Ring took home Game of the Year at the Game Awards Thursday, but the Game Awards is as much or more about game announcements as it is about game winners. Here are some of the big announcements. Final Fantasy 16 coming to the PS5 on June 22nd. Diablo 4 got a release date of June 6th. Star Wars Jedi Survivor arrives March 17th. From Software announced that Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon is coming to the PlayStation, Xbox, and Steam sometime next year. And Horizon Forbidden West and Cyberpunk 2077 will both get expansions next year. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission's lawsuit to halt Meta's proposed acquisition of Within Inc. began on Friday. Within is the maker of VR apps like Supernatural. The FTC says that Meta, Meta is uh, attempting to dominate the VR fitness market by buying its competitors. Meta told the court it believes the FTC improperly defined the market and underestimated competition coming from companies like Apple, Alphabet, and ByteDance. Yeah, this is the new look FTC trying to stop people from buying potential competitors. We'll see if they can convince a court to do that. Google added pass keys to Chrome stable M108. That allows password-free logins if a website supports it. There are a few out there that do, PayPal, for example. Uh, if you're using Chrome on Windows 11, Mac OS, and Android, you can now use pass keys on participating websites. And Google also added pass key syncing support to Android. Uh, so you can sync from Android using either Google's own password manager or a third party like Dashlane or 1Password. Yay, passkeys. Apple and Ericsson reached a cross-licensing agreement on patented, patented cellular standard essential technologies. This settles lawsuits over 5G patents from October of 2021. A trial on the lawsuits began this week in the Eastern District of Texas. And PlayStation VR 2 pre-orders are open for everybody with a PlayStation account. Uh, they, they opened last month, but you had to register and then be chosen by Sony to put in an order for the PSVR 2, but it appears you can now order the VR 2 headset from the PlayStation Direct website, and you might even get it within a week or two of the February launch. Let's talk about exploding missiles. Uh, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution Thursday asking countries not to conduct direct ascent anti-satellite tests, a.k.a. ASATs if they will result in space debris. You can conduct one, just don't blow anything up, okay? <laughs> a Russian missile test in November 2021, uh, where they blew up their own satellite. Nobody's blowing up other people's satellites, but Russia blew up one of its own satellites, and it caused enough debris that the International Space Station, staffed partially by Russians, required crew to shelter in docked capsules temporarily. Uh, Russia, China, India, and the U.S. are the only countries who have conducted ASATs, but the U.S. was the only country to vote in favor of the resolution out of those four countries. So some celebrities will get an up-close look at any of the space debris and the ISS if a planned SpaceX mission actually takes place, and it sounds like it might. In 2018, SpaceX auctioned off seats on the first crewed test of the Starship vehicle, which will take eight days to circle around the moon, coming within 200 kilometers of the surface. Japanese fashion industry billionaire Yusaku Maizawa bought all of the seats for the entire mission, which will be called Dear Moon. He then recruited people to join him and announced his picks on Thursday. All right, let's talk about who he picked. The crew will include 
Korean group Big Bang's lead rapper Top, uh, a.k.a. Che Sung Hyun, uh, U.S. DJ Steve Aoki, Indian actor Dev Joshi, YouTuber the everyday astronaut Tim Dodd, Czech multidisciplinary artist Yemi A.D., Irish photographer Rhiannon Adam, photographer Kareem Ilya, documentary filmmaker Brendan Hall, and then two alternates in case one or more of those folks can't go for some reason uh, on the wait list, <laughs> on the uh, the standby, the standby list uh, for the trip to the moon, U.S. Olympic snowboarder Caitlin Farrington and Japanese dancer Miyu. Uh, so she had in space tourism, not just for billionaires anymore. <laughs> it's also for their celebrity friends and apparently photographers. The, the photographer part makes perfect sense to me, yeah, I want a documentary filmmaker on there. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of this, though? It's uh, yeah, I I have feelings. <laughs> I'm most excited to see like everyday astronaut, a fellow content creator, a fellow YouTuber going up there. And for for me, the the photographers, the documentary, um, those folks make sense. The fact that he is going up there as well that makes sense because he's very educational and. I kind of wish that this entire team was a little bit more educational, especially for like younger generations, because I have a feeling that we're going to see space tourism kind of act like planes did when planes were first invented. Extremely expensive. Only the mm -hmm. very privileged people could go up and, you know, actually fly on a plane across the country. Now we're seeing the same thing with space tourism. Only the billionaires can actually afford to go up into space. Hopefully in the next few decades, we'll see that price decrease over time and be able to see, you know, less privileged middle income folks also be able to go up there. Will that happen? Maybe it'll be after my lifetime, but I would mm. like to see it happen. I, I also sort of wish that, you know, he had a website, Yusasu did, or Yusaku did, and of over, apparently about a million people applied for this and the people that he chose seem to be very well privileged folks i mean let's be honest and i i wish it was a little bit more like folks that we hadn't heard of maybe like a a, a teacher from a middle school like nasa has done mm. that in the past unfortunately that shuttle blew up but they've done that in the past and i would love to see the same thing happen with SpaceX to kind of show people and promote that space tourism in the future can be for everybody. And it's something that we can look forward to for our younger generations. Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying there. Um, I, I think the fact that this is going to be expensive to begin with makes sense to me. Uh, just just mm -hmm. like you said, air, airplane travel was incredibly expensive. That's why people dressed up to get on airplanes, uh, even when I was yeah. a kid uh, still. So I get that. Uh, I'll give him a B plus on the selection, right? So let's set aside like, well, it has to be a billionaire to afford it. Uh, I like that he decided to not just invite his friends, but, but open it up to submissions. Uh, I think these photographers... Uh, most of which I'm not I'm unfamiliar with are are great because it's going to make me more familiar with them. It's going to be the kinds of things you would want people to do, uh, which is take photos, you know, mm -hmm. document the 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 experience. They're from uh, around the world. Uh, granted, you picked an actor from India to represent yeah. <laughs> India. I don't know. Maybe Deb Josh, he's like a huge, uh, you know, proponent of astronomy. And, and that's a that's a possibility, right? There are certain actors we could have picked uh, here in the United States that you'd say, oh, yeah, but they've always been, in, you know, promoting with NASA and stuff like that. Maybe that's true. I just don't know enough about it. Uh, I have no idea if Top uh, should be working on his comeback album instead of going up to the moon. I'm not sure why he's there. <laughs> I love Steve Aoki. Like, mic drop, Steve Aoki. Good job getting on there. But again, I don't know what he brings to that. Maybe composition, though. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. Top and Steve Aoki are going to, like, collaborate on music inspired by the trip, and that would be very cool. So I'm, I'm not against anybody on this list, but when it does come down to it, the reason I'm saying B-plus instead of an A is exactly what you said. I would have liked to see somehow someone unexpected uh, yeah. chosen, uh, you know, like you say, like an educator or something. Uh, but again, I like that everybody on here at least probably has something they're going to bring back with them from it. It's not just like, hey, I, I was uh, friends with this guy, so I got on it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. I would like for all of them to bring something back, something mm -hmm. so that I can feel like it's an experience that I can feel emotionally connected to, uh, especially if I have kids in the future and I want them to look forward to this as something that they can potentially experience in the future. So for me, it's very much like future driven. I just, I want to see, I want to this to be as much about like, you know, regular people as it is for the celebrities. Yeah. I, but don't forget, it's dangerous. Like, you yeah, know. it is. <laughs> I don't mind waiting a few decades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about Amazon uh, trying to get rid of barcodes. Uh, you know, at, 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 at when they were new, barcodes were revolutionary. They they were a way for a machine to identify a product, something that you, you really couldn't do very easily. But Robots are more sophisticated now and therefore have just as much trouble finding a barcode as you do at self-checkout at the grocery store. Uh, that's, uh, that's no joke. Uh, Amazon is therefore uh, saying, you know what? We make a lot of fine warehouse robotics. Let's kill the barcode. Let's kill the barcode. Amazon started by taking pictures of all the products that travel through its warehouses in order to build up this library of product images. Amazon is what is, uh, they're using what is called a multimodal identification, which is this fancy way of saying that it uses more than one way to identify an item. Like they'll look at the size, the appearance, etc. Amazon uses its multimodal identification library of images to train a model to be able to identify those products products without needing to scan any kind of code, a bar, a QR, or otherwise. So initially, they got accuracy around 75 to 80%, which is still really good, but they have refined that model enough to claim 99% accuracy now. Yeah. So they haven't brought it to the robots yet, but they have started with cameras. There's a, a test pilot they, they operated in Poland uh, and now have the full thing running in Amazon warehouses in Barcelona and Hamburg. Here's how it works. A conveyor belt uh, moves trays with products in it. That, that's just the way the Amazon warehouse automated system works. The algorithm then uses cameras to scan as the products fly by to see if the right product is in the tray. There's a list as this stuff goes out of what it's supposed to be. If you've ever got the wrong product in your Amazon box, that list failed. This system is going to check that. The longer they use this system, the more images they get and the better the model can become. That's important because it's fairly easy to scan an item that's sitting motionless in a tray moving at a constant speed. That, that's what they're able to do with 99% accuracy now. However, robots and even humans pick items up, move them around, they move them fast, they move them in weird ways. So it's more difficult to recognize in things in that situation. But Amazon is confident that it can get there. Eventually, Amazon wants this system to be good enough so that robots could just pick up an item and know what it is without having to scan and turn it around looking for a barcode. I feel like over time, this is going to make warehouse ordering and shipments so much more efficient and more accurate for c customers as well as Amazon itself. And it will probably save them a ton of money on things like returns and refunds whenever you do receive the wrong product. In fact, I was talking to my mom on the phone this morning and she received the wrong product in the in the in Amazon oh, order, yeah. and she didn't understand how to send it back to them. So I had to walk her through the process. So this will also be really good for consumers who don't want to deal with like that stress and deal with that, especially around the holiday season. Um, have you ever been in an Amazon Go store, like one of those fully automated stores where you just pick things up and walk out with it? And yeah. It knows who you are and it charges you after you've left. It's so efficient and it's so fast. And you don't like if you're very introverted, you don't have to talk to anybody. It's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Whole Foods in Los Angeles. I think we have two of them maybe uh, where they put the Amazon Go system in the Whole Foods. So I you walk. That. Yeah, you walk in, you throw stuff in your cart and then you literally just walk out uh, and you get charged. Uh, I that's why I sometimes look at that. When I was looking at this today, I was like, this is less than it seems in a way mm -hmm. because they already do this They're in grocery stores. It. Right yeah. now, granted the, in the, the number of individual SKUs, inventory items in a grocery store is lower than 
Amazon's entire retail operation, right? Mm -hmm. By by an order of magnitude. You you probably, I don't know, I'm going to guess you might have a thousand or so, maybe a couple thousand uh, individual items you have to track in a Whole Foods, whereas you literally have millions of items that you've got to track uh, in Amazon. So it's a bigger deal uh, if you want to get above 99%. And, and given the amount of things that Amazon ships, 99% is still going to allow a lot of misidentification, right? So you right. want to get that as close to 100% as you can get it. Uh, I, it, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm coming around to saying is this shouldn't surprise us that the company who's able to tell that you picked, you know, a box of granola off the shelf in a grocery store is going to apply that to their warehouses, right? It makes, it makes sense. It almost feels like the grocery stores and like the, the Amazon and Whole Foods are like tests so that they can eventually mm -hmm. bring the same technology to the warehouses on a much grander scale because like these, these minuscule tests with human beings, like that's a good start. But what if you can really, really compound that and make it into a huge thing for the warehouse? Houses. like talk about profits they're going to be they're going to make so much money off of this they're going to oh, yeah. save so much time and it's going to be so efficient like i can see of course this is where amazon is going to go with it yeah it's good no, news it's for them it's a really good point because what amazon did with aws was say instead of just running a website let's be a cloud company right and i think what i think what you're pointing out is with with their retail operations they're saying let's not just run a store let's be a logistics platform you know? yeah yeah. Uh, folks, we get a lot of great ideas about what to talk about the show from our subreddit. If you haven't checked it out, there's a great community over there submitting stories, talking to each other about the stories. You'll want to get over there and submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Now, this caught my eye on MLB.com, of all places today. Business intelligence company Morning Consult which does lots of surveys, released their fastest growing brands of 2022. So I know a lot of you are immediately going to ask how they determine what a fast growing brand is. Here's what they say. They survey tens of thousands of people worldwide every day. If you follow politics, you've heard of Morning Consult. Uh, they do surveys in all sectors of businesses, politics, and all kinds of stuff. And for this survey, they measured, quote, the share of consumers who said they would consider purchasing from a brand over the course of the year. So I didn't see the survey, but I, I, I expect it means that they said, hey, here's a list of brands. Which of these do you think you will consider purchasing something from? Growth was determined, so the measure of growth, by taking the share of consumers who said they were considering purchasing from the brand in October, so October 1st through the 31st, and then subtracting the number who said the same thing in January, right? So it's it's just how you figure out growth, right? Number of people who said in October they were going to buy from DTNS was 10, in January it was 7, so it grew by 3, and then you make a percentage. 1,689 brands were included in the survey. So now that we know how they did it, Shannon, what did we find out? Okay. Some of this might surprise y'all. The fastest growing brand overall, and one of the reasons that we're talking about this one on DTNS was Meta. Since the question is whether you are considering a purchase from the brand, and since sub-brands form companies like Facebook are treated separately, this likely has to do with the MetaQuest headsets. Now, Crocs, this is the one that I was surprised about, was number two, <laughs> <laughs> and beats by Dr. Dre, was number three. Hmm. Zell was interestingly number six, and Adobe is number seven. T Mobile was number 12. Boost Mobile was followed after them, number 19. And no other tech companies made the top 20. Yeah. So Weird. we're going to get to why is Meta worldwide the fastest growing yeah. brand in a second? But there's some interesting tech companies showing up when you break it down by age range. The number one fastest growing brand among Gen Z was Roku. <laughs> right? What? Like, yeah. So weird. Yeah, that would not have been my guess. Um, also, the other tech companies showing up on the Gen Z list, Google Sheets at number nine and awesome Samsung weird. Galaxy Watch at number 14. Uh, to let's get so strange. Let's get into the millennials because the millennials dominate all uh, online conversations, right? So the millennials, the, what do they care about? Actually, not much. Meta was number eleven. 
No tech companies in the top 10. <laughs> AirPods was number 16. Microsoft Excel was 17. Uh, 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 Uni Univision's streaming service VIX was 18. And Beats by Dre was 20. Beats by Dre. So crossing the generations in its appeal. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Our generation, Generation X, had online clothier Shein at number one. And see, I thought this was a Gen Z brand. We're the one. Maybe that's why we're like, hey, we should buy clothes where the young people clothes. Uh, <laughs> Meta was number two uh, amongst Gen X. Boost Mobile was number three. Google Docs, number six. Google Sheets, number 10. Zelle, number 11. Microsoft Excel, number 12. And then the old folks, the boomers, T-Mobile first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy that one of those T-Mobile phones. Uh, Meta was also second among boomers. Booking.com third because more retirees, so they're traveling. Mm -hmm. Microsoft Outlook, number four. Uh, Apple finally shows up on a list at number nine. Xfinity, wow. number 10. YouTube Shorts, <laughs> number 11. They don't truck with the TikTok, but the boomers, they like the YouTube Shorts. Uh, Microsoft Start, which is number 17, that is the Air to MSN. That's the news app from Microsoft. Uh, and Zelle, number 20. So Zelle showing up across the generations here. Uh, Shannon, what's your best guess for why Meta showed up number one worldwide overall and, and so high on, on the older folks' lists? So that is so weird to me. So weird. I, I'm going to guess it has to do with VR. But I honestly, like... That one surprised me a lot because I think about Meta and I think about how younger generations are like, ugh, Facebook, like, no, we're on TikTok, but TikTok's not even on this list. So what's going on? <laughs> Where is everybody? <laughs> I, I think what's going on with Meta is that people are considering buying the Quest. That, that, mm. That's got to be it. Yeah. Uh, pe people are thinking like, you know so. what? That VR I might, uh, the Meta Quest, I know about the Meta Quest. It could be that they're thinking about buying ads on Facebook, I suppose, mm -hmm. and they attribute it to Meta. Because again, this is self-reported. Are you thinking of buying something from Meta? And a lot of people said yet. Yes. It's good news for Meta that, they, that right. there's so much brand awareness around Meta because when they changed the name of the company from Facebook to Meta, a lot of people weren't sure that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it does make sense from that standpoint. I, I will agree with you there. Another one that kind of surprised me was that Gen Z topped Roku on their list. And Roku's been around for such a long time as kind of a underdog when it comes to streaming. It sounds like they're really getting the gears rolling in terms of getting more brand recognition, uh, which I'm happy to see because Roku's always been a really good player in that field. So it's kind of cool to see them there. Google Sheets and uh, Microsoft Excel being on li different lists is not very surprising to me since a lot mm. more people are working from home. There's a lot more remote work and using cloud platforms to do uh, collaboration work. That makes sense. Uh, the other ones are kind of odd there. Zelle also kind of makes sense for payment platforms. That's definitely been growing in the past few years, but can we talk about Crocs at number two? <laughs> so <It's>, weird. <laughs> overall, right? Like this, if it was a generational thing, I, I'd probably yeah, have more overall. theories. But yeah, number one meta, number two Crocs, number three Beats by Dre. Like yeah. Beats by Dre makes perfect sense to me. People mm -hmm. are considering buying uh, some headphones, some earbuds, and they're probably like, you know, I'll probably just end up buying AirPods. But let me see. Let me, well, I'm right. considering Beats by Dre. And so they're more likely to say that uh, on here. That makes sense to me because they're they're cool. I have some Beats by Dre uh, AirPods or, or AirBuds, earbuds, uh, and, I, and I love them. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I too, I, I think the Roku thing is very telling that Gen Z is not into cable, right? Xfinity is yeah. the boomers. <laughs> Roku is Gen right. Z. But it's Roku. It's not Fire TV. It's not Chromecast. It's not Chromecast. It's yeah. not Apple TV, you know. And it's, it's not Roku. any specific TV brand either, although Roku right? does work on TVs. They have right? operating systems in TVs. So that makes more sense, especially since they're growing their brand awareness in that segment too, not just using boxes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a good very point. Very interesting. 
Uh, folks, if you have theories about this, uh, especially if you're from one of these generations, which I assume you are from one of them, unless we have some Gen Alpha folks out there listening to us, uh, <laughs> send us your theories. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Well, it is all the rage with Google being the latest to release its annual year in search report outlining the top global searches of 2022. The New York Times game Wordle held the number one spot with mm. all search ter terms. Not super surprising there. But the second most searched term this year was India versus England, which was in reference to the Cricket World Cup. The word Ukraine held the number three spot obvious reasons there. Ukraine held the spot in this year's list of trending news topics, and Queen Elizabeth's passing was the second most trending news topic. Election results was number three. As for people's people of interest, Johnny Depp was the most searched person globally. Mm -hmm. Thor Love and Thunder saw the most searches globally for a film. Mm. Hmm. And Euphoria was the TV show with the most searches on Google. Uh, Google also said the most popular search query starting with what is was what is NATO. Ah, okay. Ah. That goes with Ukraine. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it does. Uh, India, England was huge. That that makes sense to me. Uh, Euphoria was huge. Uh, right. Interesting to know that it was huge worldwide. Wordle, I didn't expect to last all year, but it. But I'm not but surprised, it <laughs> you know. Uh, it, did, it did. The only one that I think threw me was Thor Love and Thunder. I was like, was that this year? Like, Yeah, it's we been... had to like look up the... The, when it released, it was so yeah. weird. <laughs> it feels like it was so much longer ago. And there have been so many other movies come out since, yeah. but it, uh, it dominated the the search results. Yeah, I kind of love that people are looking up what is NATO so they can kind of educate themselves on these, mm -hmm. these very global, very important um, uh, agencies. And that's that's a big one. So that's really cool. I like yeah. seeing that. Yeah, and the, and it was Good a job, huge people. topic in February when the war it in Ukraine was. began. So yeah. It, yeah, that makes sense that that people would be looking for it then. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Tyler weighed in on our conversation about notifications from yesterday. Uh, Tyler says, "I definitely hit no over notification overload a long time ago, and have learned that it needs to be managed. Having a smartwatch has actually been the biggest help in managing the impulse to check every single notification all the time. At least for me, I'm not sure if the Apple Watch has this functionality, but with my Galaxy Watch, are you?" A uh, Gen Z? Is that, isn't that who had the Galaxy Watch on there? Uh, says, I'm sorry. But with my Galaxy Watch, I have very few notifications that get to the watch, even if those notifications are turned on on my phone. Gmail, for example, notifications are on my phone, but not on my watch. I do want the notifications, but I don't need Gmail notifications right away. Messaging apps, yes, those notify me on my watch because I probably should know if my mom's texting me. What this lets me know is that if a notification notification hits my watch, I should probably check it. But everything else can wait and will be waiting for me on my phone the next time I pick it up. It has really helped me not pick up my phone for every single notification while still allowing more notifications to hit my phone than I probably should. Just my two cents. But they're Canadian cents, so there weren't even less. That is not true, Tyler. Your cents are worth, I would say, your cents are undervalued. Your cents are worth very much. Because I do the same thing. I use my watch as kind of a filter, and I only send certain notifications to it for yeah. exactly the same reasons he's talking about. Me too. I just pulled out my Pixel Watch, and I was like, yeah, I've been doing the exact same thing with my Pixel Watch. Like, less notifications is great, and it has kind of taught me over time not to pull out my phone constantly. So it's it's a good thing. Like, it yeah. definitely helps. An excellent, excellent uh, tip there, Tyler. Thank you for writing in. I'd say these are worth at least three cents, probably a lot more, to be honest. Uh, you know who else is worth three cents and uh, a lot more is Len Peralta. Len, oh, you. uh, you've been drawing Hi, millions Len. of dollars worth of art during you know, our I am our show. unapologetically Gen X, okay? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I feel like... Um, you know, get off my lawn sort of feel. So you had the story about the barcodes. Ah. I was like, must we get rid of barcodes? Come on. Uh, <laughs> I get I get why we want to move. You're to the old future, and stuck in your ways. I get it. I, I get am. It. Yeah, yeah, I am yeah. very old and stuck in my ways. So <laughs> I took today's art uh, from the, the view of the uh, oh my gosh, of the funny. barcode. If you guys and I said I'm unapologi unapologetically, unapologetically uh, Gen X. People wouldn't probably recognize this as uh, a, a little take on Schoolhouse mm -hmm. Rock or yep. as someone in the chat called Schoolhouse Mock. 
Uh, but this hey. is a this is a song, you know. I'm just a code the Bezos wants to unload. You know, Aww. he's just a bill. Oh, yeah. He's only a bill or a code. <laughs> only a That's bill. so cute. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you like this piece of art, you uh, you can go get it right now if you're a Patreon backer. Patreon.com forward slash Len. You can also uh, just get it the old-fashioned way at LenPeraltaStore.com, where I am also. Uh, taking orders through the 20th for my custom holiday card. So why ah, don't you jump on that if you get can. Get them while they're hot. Get them while they're hot. Uh, Shannon, I know you just got back from Japan. What do you got going I on for did. people to look at? Well, I am jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse. Um, two things. One, I'm super close to 85,000 subscribers. Nice. So if you want to subscribe and help me get to 85K, I would appreciate it so, so much. And also, I just did an, a, a video called Five Best VPNs. It's my my choices for five best VPNs from my security and privacy background. It's not sponsored by any VPNs. I know most VPN reviews are sponsored. Mm -hmm. So this one is not. It's sponsored by a completely different company. So <laughs> definitely check it out if you want an unsponsored review of some really good VPNs in 2022 slash 2023 to choose from. Excellent. Also, uh, thanks to our brand new boss, Ted, who just started backing us on Patreon. Ted's middle name is Patreon, according to what Ted put in on Patreon as well. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ted, uh, for, for starting to back at us. Welcome. Here's what you're in on, Ted, because you backed us today. Just last night, I updated our loyalty merch. Uh, wow. The loyalty merch on Patreon gives you a mer piece of merchandise every three months that you stay as a patron at that level. Uh, in the past, we've done this. It might mean you end up with four stickers or four T-shirts. And we've had different art from Len on each one of those T-shirts, but it's still four T-shirts. This year, we still have art from Len. It's our ninth year anniversary art because we're hitting our ninth year anniversary <gasps> on January 2nd. Cute. And you'll get a different product every three months that you stay a patron with that a logo on it. It's kind of a, a USB meets a floppy disk and the floppy disk looks like a nine. It's way cool. Len outdid himself uh, with this. So if you want that merch, be like Ted, sign up and then stick around every three months. You're going to get something and associate producers are even getting something this year. We, we haven't been able to do it at all the levels this year, all but the lowest level get merch. Uh, that's, uh, that's just what we're, we're doing as, as Patreon makes it easier to do this sort of stuff. So, uh, fun stuff for you to get as a thank you for supporting us at patreon.com slash D T N S. Another thing you get, if you stick around, is, of course, the ability to listen to Good Day Internet, our extended show. It's going to start now. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Iaz Akhtar. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from the amazing Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Nika Monford, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Shannon Morse. Guests on this week's show included Andrea Jones-Roy, John C. Dvorak, and Rich Demuro and thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>